Good afternoon. Uh, this is our second tape for gas metal arc welding, Weld 1770. We're looking at chapter 22, gas metal arc welding practice. Uh, starts on page 807. And uh, what it is, it's gas metal arc welding. And I put a slide back up here. You've seen this one in our last lecture. It shows all the equipment and everything that we're going to be doing. Um, on page 807 where it says operating variables that affect weld formation. Welding variables, you should know that welding variables are those factors that affect the operation of the arc and the weld deposit. Uh, sound welding of good appearance results when the variables are in balance. That's the important thing about that equipment. If you'll flip the page, you can go ahead and uh, some of these things that have to be in balance are the type of current that you're going to be using. So, bullet, direct current electrode positive is what we use with gas metal arc welding. It says electrode positive is generally used for gas metal arc welding because it provides maximum heat input into the work. It allows relatively deep penetration to take place. It also assists in the removal of oxides from the plate which contributes to a clean weld deposit of high quality. Low, low current values produce a globular transfer of metal from the electrode. A gradual increase in current increases the electrode melting rate so that at relatively high current values the spray transfer of metal is produced. Although current is the first requirement to achieve spray transfer, shielding gas and voltage are also very important. On carbon steel, the shielding gas must contain a minimum of 80% argon. Uh, the voltage levels must be high enough to keep the electrode from dipping into the weld pool. So if you remember from our last lecture, we talked about short circuit transfer, globular transfer, spray transfer, and pulse transfer. Those are the four types of metal transfer. And it's, just not, it's not simply a matter of turning up your amperage, but you have to have the correct gas uh, in order to achieve that transfer. And for spray arc, we're going to use a, a combination of 90-10. For short circuit, we're going to use 75-25. Uh, direct current electrode negative. The electrode ne negative has a limited use in the welding of, of thin gauge metals. The greatest amount of heat occurs at the electrode tip. Uh, the wire melt off rate is a great deal faster than with DCEP. Uh, the arc is not stable at the end of the filler wire and it becomes very difficult to direct the transfer of weld metal where it is desired. The erratic arc results in poor fusion and a considerable amount of spatter. Penetration is also less than it is with uh, DCEP. So we're not going to use DCEP very often, just in special applications. Alternating current. Alternating current is seldom used in gas metal arc welding. That's all you really have to know about that. Um, so you will get a question on the different types of welding, uh, welding currents, and uh, the answer we'll be looking for is direct current electrode positive. Shielding gases. Argon and helium were first used as the shielding gases for the gas metal arc process as they continue to be the basic gases. Argon is used more than helium on ferrous metals to keep spatter at a minimum. Argon is also heavier than air and therefore gives off a better coverage. That's a bullet. Argon is heavier than air. Oxygen or carbon dioxide is added to the pure gases to improve arc stability, minimize undercut, reduce porosity, and improve the appearance of the weld. So this is a bullet too. You may get a question as to why would they add this stuff? Why are they going to, to, to try to change the arc characteristics by, by adding a, some CO2 to, uh, to argon, for example? Where are they going to do it to improve the arc stability, to minimize undercut, reduce porosity? So that would be your answer there. Dropping down to the last paragraph, it says carbon dioxide is popular as a shielding medium because of the following advantages. Low cost. Most high schools will use pure uh, CO2 because it's the cheapest of all the gases. So that's the number one thing. If you're asked the question, well, why would anybody want to use CO2 if it causes oxidation and sometimes embrittlement? Low cost. So low cost, and then over in the, uh, on the next page, high density resulting in low flow rates and burn back problems because of its shorter arc characteristics. So the answer I would be looking for there would be a low cost. Um, the following recommendations concerning specific metals are helpful. I've only bulleted a few of these here because they're the ones you're going to be dealing with. Aluminum alloys, they're going to use an argon gas. With direct current electrode positive, argon removes surface oxides. When you're welding with aluminum, um, whenever aluminum is exposed to the air, 
it's, it's going to interact. There's a chemical reaction between the air and the aluminum itself. And that causes an oxide to be built up on the, on the outside of the aluminum. This oxide has to be broken down. The oxide melts at about 3,700 degrees, I believe it is, whereas the aluminum itself will, will melt at a considerably lower temperature. So you've got to get that oxide out of the way. And AC is generally used for that uh, on TIG welding because of the alternating current. It'll break it down on the DC electrode positive cycle, and do, then you do your welding with a DC electrode negative cycle. So it's cycling back and forth, but it's that DC EP that breaks down that oxide. And so that's why they mention it in here, uh, running aluminum on, on straight DCEP gives you that breaking down power uh, so that you can break up that oxide and get a weld. You don't get that if you use DCEN. So aluminum alloys, that's a bullet. Then drop down to stainless steel. Now, it says argon plus oxygen as the, as the shielding gas. Uh, in my experience, I, I, I used to weld stainless steel using, using the gas metal arc welding process. Uh, and we used a trimix, and the trimix was composed of 90% argon, 7.5% uh, CO2, and 2.5% oxygen. So it was a slightly different gas. So um, it just shows there's more than one type of, of gas that can be used, but I'm, we used a trimix. You may, may get a question uh, to the effect of what type of a shielding gas would you use with the gas metal arc welding process if you were going to weld stainless steel? And it might be a multiple choice question or something like that. The answer I'm going to look for is a gas that would, would include the phrase trimix, or I may even have uh, argon, CO2, and, he and uh, oxygen put in there, or maybe even helium, because there's several different, different types that you can do. So uh, the key phrase here would be a trimix. You're going to be looking for a trimix. Uh, drop down to mild steel, and it says... Uh, to weld mild steel, you're going to use 15% uh, argon, 25% carbon dioxide, or 100% CO2. We use 75-25 for the short circuit transfer. So remember this, 75-25 for short circuit, and 90-10 for the spray arc transfer. I want you to remember those two because those are the ones that you use here in the welding lab. And you may get a question saying, okay, we're going to weld some mild steel with the short circuit transfer process. What gas are we going to use? I'll be looking for 75-25, okay? Over in the next column, under joint preparation, the, the second paragraph reads, the arc in gas metal arc welding is somewhat more penetrating and narrower than the arc in shielded metal arc welding. Therefore, heavier root faces and smaller root openings may be used for groove welds. Um, well, we all know, and I've mentioned it a number of times before, that short circuit transfer using gas metal arc has the lowest amount of heat input of any of the welding processes. It is so low that the American Welding Society does not recognize uh, gas metal arc welding short circuit as a pre-qualified welding procedure. So you have to do uh, mechanical tests uh, on any kind of a weldment like that to prove that the process is going to work. So what they're talking about here is if you're using the spray arc or globular transfer mode, because that does generate more heat, and then that makes that a true statement. But it's not really a true statement if you're, if you're working with the short circuit transfer. So drop down to the end of that paragraph and it says, typically, the higher energy spray arcs are used with the narrower groove angle and the heavier root face joint design. So here's justification for what I've, I'm talking about. It, it's a true statement if they're using spray arc. It's not a true statement if they're using short circuit. It says the penetration achieved with shielded, shielded metal arc electrodes is about one eighth of an inch maximum in steel. With the MIG or MAG process, 100% penetration may be secured in one quarter inch plate in a square butt joint welded from both sides. What they're talking about there, this is a square groove butt joint. And it's one quarter of an inch thick. And if you use the spray arc transfer mode, you can get penetration like that from one side and then you can get penetration like that from the other side. And so you don't have any other, you don't have to have any other type of preparation. And that's what this statement is saying. If you can weld up to one quarter of an inch mild steel from both sides with the spray arc and make it fuse together without any kind of, of uh, edge, edge preparation at all. So that's what they're talking about there. Um, over in the next column, electrode diameter. This is a bullet. The electrode diameter influences the size of the weld bead, the depth of penetration, and the speed of welding. So you may get a question regarding that. As a general rule, for the same current, 
the arc becomes more penetrating as the electrode diameter increases. Um, at the same time, the speed of welding is also affected because of the deposition or burn-off rate also increases. When welding with wires below uh, 0 0.045 inches or 45 thousandths of an inch, the smaller wire operating at a given current density burns off faster than the larger wire. To get the maximum deposition rate at a given current density, use the smallest wire possible that is consistent with acceptable weld profile. In my career, and I've done an awful lot of this, awful lot of this, nine years in fabrication shops, uh, we used either 045 wire or 035 wire, and that was about it. Occasionally you get up to 1 16th wire, but that's, that's some really heavy duty welding, and that's not stuff I'd care to, care to be around. Drop down to the next paragraph where it says, as in all welding, the selection of the type and size of wire is important. Generally, filler wire should be the same composition as the materials being welded. There we go again. Uh, it should, the filler wire should be the same composition as, as the material being welded. That's one of your, that is the, probably your number one consideration when you're gonna, going to make a weld. Uh, you're not going to weld mild steel with stainless steel. You're not going to weld uh, copper with aluminum. You've got to match the base metals to the filler metal. That's your number one consideration. So that is a bullet because you may find that uh, as a question on your test. The position of welding or other special conditions may affect the size of the electrode. For most purposes, however, uh, filler wires with diameters of 023 to 025, 030, and 035 inch, these are the best ones for thin materials. Diameters of 045 or 1 16th of an inch are for medium thicknesses, and diameters of 1 8th of an inch is, is best for the heavy materials. And you'll find that in our submerged arc of welding. Um, that's an automatic process with, a, with, with of course, the, the separate uh, flux blanket. And if you look at the w size of the wire in there, uh, I think that's 564 or something like that. It's getting pretty big. Um, electrode extension. This is not in your book, but it's very similar to figure 22.6. Uh, where they're talking about electrode extension. If you look at this slide, this is the MIG process. Here's your workpiece. Here's your, your nozzle. The contact tip where the, where the energy is transferred to the electrode itself. Um, your contact tip tube setback is this distance here. So you can see it's set back. No problem. Typically, it's an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. So your electrode extension then is from the tip to however far out it goes, but your stick out is the distance from the end of the cup to the end of the wire. So these are some terms that you need to be familiar with. Um, and it's explained in your book here. It says electrode extension is that length of filler wire that extends past the contact tube, which is where the energy is transferred to the wire. So no, no electrode extension. This is the area where preheating of the wire, filler wire occurs. The electrode extension is also called stick out. Now you'll notice here that our, our slide actually makes it a different, uh, uh, two different things. Here, here, and this slide is put out by the American Welding Society and they're calling the stick out the distance that it extends past the end of the cup. Um, and then the extension does go along with what it says in the book. Extension is from the, from the tip of the uh, contact tip to the end of the electrode but they're really calling it two different things uh, on our slide as opposed to your book. Over on the next page, first column says short electrode extensions one eighth of an inch to one half inch are used for the short circuit mode of transfer, generally with the smaller diameter electrodes. For stainless steel, favor the shorter electrode extensions because of its higher res resistivity. Uh, the longer electrode extensions are used for spray arcs. Uh, the relationship that exists between electrode extension and current and electrode extension and penetration should be understood. And you can look at table 22.1 to get an idea of that. Tests have, been indi have indicated that when electrode extension is increased from 1 16th, pardon me, from 3 16th to 5 eighths of an inch, the welding current then drops approximately 60 amperes. Uh, the current is reduced because of the change in the amount of preheating that takes place in the wire. As the electrode extension is increased, the preheating of the wire increases. Thus, less welding current is required from the power source at a given feed rate. Because of the self-regulating characteristics of the constant voltage power source, the welding current is decreased. 
As the welding current is decreased, the depth of penetration also decreases. Increased electrode extension also increases the weld deposition rate. On the other hand, if the electrode extension decreases, the preheating of the wire is, is reduced and the power source furnishes more current in order to melt the wire at the required rate. This increase in welding current causes an increase in penetration. Uh, position of the gun. Turn this off. This is figure 22-7 on the, on the next page. You can look at that while I read from the book here. It says, the gun angle can be compared to the angle of the electrode in the shoulder metal arc welding. The drag and push nozzle angles are shown in figure 22-8, and the drag technique results in a high, narrow bead with relatively deeper penetration. The penetration is deeper because the arc tends to run into the pool and create a greater concentration of heat. Uh, the force of the arc pushes the molten metal back from the rounded contour. Ma uh, maximum penetration is obtained when a drag angle of about 10 degrees is used. As the drag angle is reduced, the bead height decreases and, and the width increases. Uh, the arc and the leading push technique uh, strikes cold metal so that penetration is shallow and the force of the arc pushes the metal ahead of the, of the bead and flattens the contour of the bead. Increased travel speeds are a characteristic of the push technique. Actually, I have the wrong slide up there. Let me put this one up. This is figure 22-8 that, that he's talking about here. So, here we have our here we have our drag angle. Pardon me, we have a little technical difficulty there. So here we have our direction of travel. Here's our base metal, our gun, um, and this is a drag technique. Whenever you're doing the drag technique, this is the one that I've taught all of you is that this is what you generally want to use. You're only going to use the push technique when you're doing vertical up and such uh, because you're going to get, get increased penetration uh, when you're working in the vertical up using the push technique uh, as opposed to the drag technique. Whenever you use the, you can use the drag technique in the vertical position, but that would be for, for welding downhill. And we'll get into that later on in, in a different class. This is the one that you want to use and as I've mentioned to you in the welding booth, whenever you're welding with this, you want the electrode to be hitting right here, be leading the, leading the puddle. You want it to lead the puddle so that you're maximizing the amount of heat input you can get into the parent metal and increase the, the deposition into the, or, uh, the amount of penetration into the base metal as much as you possibly can. So this is what you want to use as opposed to this because if you're pushing ahead like this, you can get rollover really easy here. Uh, using a push technique. So this is the one that, that you're going to want to use most of the time to produce uh, good welds. Uh, let's see, work angle. Let's go back to this other one now. Okay, again, reading from your book, it says, uh, I'm at the very last paragraph in column two on page 811. The work angle utilizes the natural arc force to push the weld metal against a vertical surface to prevent undercut and provide good bead contour. This has particular significance in welding lap and T-joints. High travel speeds usually require greater work angles to ensure the proper washing action. Um, here they're do they, they've set us up with some, some T-joints here. Axis of the weld, so this would be horizontal. Uh, this is your work angle and your travel angle. So your travel angle, this is a side view of it, and you can see that they've got it, got it set in about a 10 degree angle. This is the same thing they described in their book. Uh, but the work angle then is, is at about a 45. So this is how they're, they're welding a horizontal fillet weld uh, using the drag angle here. So you've got a work angle and, and a travel angle, and they're pulling it along. And this is real close to what uh, I have taught you guys in the welding booth, and Jeff has shown you guys in the welding booth. Um, again, the only thing you have to watch out for is undercut along the, top, the, the upper edge. And one thing that they, they don't really discuss here is the lace technique, which I 
I show you folks. Uh, if there's any of you that I haven't shown the lace to, uh, mention it to me and I'll be happy to show you how lace is done. So you have your travel angle, work angle, and proper, proper gun angles here. And that's what your book's talking about. Uh, arc length, this is a bullet. The constant voltage welding machine used for gas metal arc welding provides for the self-adjustment of the arc length. The power source supplies enough current to burn off the filler wire as fast as it is, as it is being fed to maintain the arc length appropriate to the voltage setting. So as I mentioned in our previous lecture, when you're adjusting your machine, what I would do is I would look at the thickness of the steel that I need to weld, first of all, and the position of welding. And that would, would tell me how much voltage I want. So if I'm welding like 16 gauge, real thin stuff, I'm going to turn that voltage down to about 15 volts or whatever. And then I will dial in my wire feed speed. And as, as I'm dialing in that wire feed speed, the amperage is increasing to melt the, any additional metal until you get it into balance. And you listen for that high frequency hum. And if I'm welding something heavy, then I'll set that voltage, I'll preset that voltage up to 19 or 20 volts, and then I'll dial it in again. And, and you can listen to that, and, and that's probably the best way and simplest way to adjust your machine so that you're getting a, 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 getting a good weld and good weld profile. And that's what your arc length is all about. That's what your, this paragraph is talking all about. It's, it's getting that relationship, that balance. Uh, between the voltage and the, and the wire feed speed. And it all starts, they, they all have to be in balance for everything to work properly. Uh, the next paragraph talks about, or the next column talks about your arc voltage. On page 813, I highlighted all of that first paragraph that, which says, in the gas metal arc process, the arc voltage has a de decided effect upon penetration, bead height, and bead width. Uh, the chief function of the voltage is to stabilize the welding arc and to provide a smooth, spat, uh, spatter-free weld. Now that's a bullet. What's the primary function of the voltage? It is to stabilize the welding arc and to provide a smooth, spatter-free weld. So if you get a qu question about that, you'll know what it is. Uh, thus, for any given welding current, there is a particular voltage that will provide the smoothest possible arc and the deepest penetration. That's just what I was talking about. Something thin, sit her down low. Something high, turn that voltage up. Then dial in the amperage to, to match it. A higher or lower arc voltage causes the arc to become unstable and affects the penetration. High arc voltage produces a wider, flatter bead. Excessive voltage also increases the possibility of porosity in the weld metal and also increases the spatter. And the same holds true if you're doing shielded metal arc welding. If, if you turn your arc force up too much, you can actually get an unstable arc and that can cause porosity in the weld. Uh, extremely low voltages cause uh, the wire to stub on the plate. Uh, so it'll sit there and it'll it, it can actually stick and start to coil up and burn um, if you have it too low. Let's see. Next column says, arc voltage is generally not set to control penetration. Voltage is much better control of well profile and arc stability. However, if the arc voltage is excessive, the energy is spread over a larger weld pool area. This will reduce the focus of the energy and reduce penetration. Conversely, if excessively low voltage is used, the wire may stub into the weld pool and produce a poor weld profile. However, penetration will be increased. Uh, a general analogy about voltage is that it, it heats the plate. The higher the voltage, the more heat goes into the plate. Uh, this, is a, this is good to remember when trying to control weld profiles. However, its effect on penetration must also be considered. Okay, wire feed speed. In the first paragraph, I, stick, I skipped the first sentence there, but I highlighted where it says there is a fixed relationship between the rate of filler wire burnoff and the welding current. The electrode wire feed speed determines the welding current. That's what we've said over and over again. Thus, current is set by the wire feed speed control on the wire feeder. So this is all a bullet. You sh there's there's going to be a question coming out of here. Uh, the welding machine supplies the amount of current necessary to melt the electrode at the rate required to maintain the preset voltage and resulting arc length. Um, so again, that's going to be a bullet. That's going to be a question on that paragraph. Dropping down to the last of that column, it says, if wire feed speeds are excessive, the welding machine cannot put out enough current to melt the wire fast enough, and then stubbing or roping of the wire occurs. And, and that's shown to, in the, uh, on the left-hand column there. You can see... Uh, correct correct uh, transfer and then 
too much, excessive. Um, welding currents. Let's go back to my slides real quick. Uh, under welding currents, put a bullet by that first paragraph and highlight the entire thing. It says, the setting at the wire feed speed control determines the amount of current that will be del delivered to the arc. The term current is often related to current density. Current density is the amperage per square inch of cross-sectional area of the electrode. Thus, at a given amperage, the current density of an electrode uh, 0.35 inch diameter is higher than that of an electrode of 0.4.5. And that's because it's, it's wider. And what all they're really saying there is the current density, if you have a wire like this, they just, cal they just calculate the area. Uh, what is the area of this thing? And then they can divide the amperage and then come up with a current density. So if, they're, if this wire is 0.35, pardon me, 0.35, uh, and, and you've got, say, say 40 amps, but then you, you have 0.45, and you still got 40 amps, the current density is going to be higher here on the smaller wire because it's got a smaller cross-sectional area than it is on this bigger wire here. Uh, same amperage, but it's more area, therefore the current density is, is less. Um, so we talked about four different types of transfer, and it's all based on e electricity and gas. We've got the spray. We have the globular. Remember, that is defined. You can tell if it's globular because the globules will be larger than the diameter of the electrode that you're running. Then we have pulsed arc, where you have your peaks, and then your background amperage. And then what you're mostly welding in is the short circuit transfer mode right here. Those are our four types of, of uh, metal transfer, all based on your amperage and gases. Over on the next page, page 815, I highlighted part of the, paragraph, part of the third paragraph which reads, there is a direct relationship between the welding current and penetration. In general, for any change in welding current, there is a corresponding change in penetration. Now this is a bullet. As the welding current increases, the penetration increases. And as the welding current decreases, the penetra penetration decreases. Uh, so whenever you're welding on the short circuit transfer, especially when you're doing your groove plates and we're going to bend those things, uh, once you get your root pass in there, which you're going to have to run kind of cold, uh, clean it up really good, and then you're going to crank it up and you're going you're gonna to run it as hot as you can, as much amperage as you can to get that depth of penetration, but you don't want it so hot that you can't control the puddle. See? So you've got to find that fine balance and that comes from practicing. But put a, pull a, put a, put a bullet on that. Uh, because I'm, I'm going to ask you about that. Um, over in, at the top of the next column, it says, uh, and I put a bullet here, if the current is too high, there is the possibility of electrode burn back into the contact tube. The arc is unstable and the gas shielding is disturbed. Spatter results, and the deposited weld metal has poor physical characteristics. So if you're cranking it up too high, you've got to look for those things. Uh, and it can burn back into the, into the contact tube. Here we have a gun. And if I, if, I was, if I had the amperage too high, it could actually burn back and stick to, the, stick to the contact tube. Here's our contact tube. Remember, this is what transfers the electricity uh, to the wire. And if I've got that wire, that amperage too high, it can actually burn back and it, it'll ball up and stick to that. So you've got to be careful not to get it too much. Also, it'll cause excessive spatter. And you can, you can bridge this up, and we'll talk about this a little bit more here in a minute. You can bridge this. And, and actually arc it across from that contact tube to your nozzle uh, if you're not careful. So you've got to make sure that everything's in balance. And as I said before, that all comes from, from practice and learning. Um, as the current is increased, the voltage must also be increased. So again, we, uh, we're, we're going back to that balance thing. If, we're, if I'm trying to suck too much amperage out of there, I can get an unstable arc. But if I bring that voltage up to match, then I won't get that burn back. It won't come back there and, and, and burn into that. Uh, if the current is too low, the filler wire may become short-circuited to the work. Uh, the electrode may become red hot and the arc will be extinguished. Uh, if the welding can be maintained, the arc is unstable and poor fusion occurs. The bead formation is high and, and limited to the surface of the base metal. You're not getting any penetration at all. Um, 
it, it if it's too low, you, you can pretty much tell. It, it, it may stick to the wire, it may coil up, it may stick to the base metal and coil up and turn red, and it's just a mess. Either way, a, a excessive amperage or, or, or too low a voltage, it, you, you're all out of balance. It's, it, and if you go back to step one, get some clean steel, cut off the end of that wire, set, preset your voltage and dial it in and listen for that humming sound, those problems will go, go away. Uh, travel speed. Tra travel speed has a decided effect on penetration, bead size, and appearance. This, this next part is a bullet. In most cases, the travel speed should be sufficient to keep the welding arc on the leading edge of the weld pool. Uh, I, I talked about this earlier, and I'm sure I've talk talked about it with all of you in, in the class itself. If your gun is here and your wire is coming out here, and you've got your, your weld built up, you want to keep that wire as much as possible being deposited right here, right where the weld metal meets the parent metal. That will do the, the utmost to increase the amount of penetration that you have into the base metal uh, while giving it as much heat as it possibly can. What you do not want to do is allow it to be deposited, deposited on top of the weld bead because then all you're going to do is just, you're just going to let that metal lay on there and, and uh, you're not getting any fusion at all. So that wire has got to be deposited at the leading edge of the puddle as you're welding. It's the only way you can do it to maximize the amount of penetration that you get. It's got to be on the leading edge, right where the weld metal is meeting the parent metal. So that is definitely a bullet. You will have a question on that. Um, drop down to just about the end of that next paragraph. It says, if the travel speed is too slow, unusual weld buildup occurs. Excessive buildup causes poor fusion, decreases penetration, porosity, inclusions, and a rough, uneven bead. Progressively increased travel speeds have opposite effects. Less weld metal is deposited with lower heat input per unit length of weld. Uh, this produces a narrow weld bead and lower contour. Excessively fast speeds causes undercut. So again, all these things that, that they're pointing out in your book can be corrected through practice. Whenever you're welding with MIG-2, you should always use just a little bit of an oscillation, even if you're running what we what a stringer bead. Well, if you try to try to pull the trigger and just run a tr straight stringer bead, uh, it's going to be thin, narrow, crowned up on you. But if you put a little oscillation on there, you're going to maximize your penetration into the into the parent metal and get a much better weld profile. So you always want to use a little bit of oscillation. Um, turn the page. And put a bullet by where it says travel speed. Travel speed is a variable that is as important as wire feed speed and arc voltage. Travel speed is influenced by the thickness of the metal being welded, the joint design, cleanliness, joint fit up, and welding position. As travel speed is increased, it is necessary to increase the wire feed speed, which in turn increases the current and the burn off rate to produce the same cross section. Excessive travel speed produces undercutting and a low rate of weld metal deposit. A speed of travel that is too low produces overlap of the base metal and even burn through of the metal. Keep in mind that, keep in mind the arc is what is melting and penetrating into the base metal. The only place you can be assured of getting good penetration is directly underneath the arc. You cannot rely on the molten weld pull to achieve good fusion and penetration. So that would be a bullet right there. The only place you can be assured of getting good penetration is directly under the arc. Bullet. Okay, let's see what's next here. Turn to page 818. We're going to talk about weld defects now. And the first one we're going to discuss is incomplete penetration. You're going to get a lot of this. You're your own best inspector. So you have to learn to recognize a well defect or discontinuity when you see it and take uh, corrective action. So these are all AWS definitions. Incomplete joint penetration, weld metal that does not extend entirely through the joint thickness. The term is used only for groove welds. So this, is, this would be incomplete penetration. Um, here are some examples of that. See, here we have a, a V groove weld. You can see this dotted line here. And they welded down here and they got some good fusion, but there's an area of that joint that, where it comes together where it didn't come all the way through. So this would only be a partial penetration joint. And depending on the welding procedure, 
Uh, sometimes partial penetration joints are, are allowed, but only if they're specified as being allowed. Here's a, here's a double V groove that they did, and they welded it from both sides, and you can see right here in the middle, they didn't get complete penetration. So here is another example of incomplete penetration. Here we have a T-joint, and you can see the vertical member has been beveled. So each side of this would be a single bevel, and if we have both sides, that's called a double bevel. So this is a double bevel T-joint, where obviously they wanted to get complete penetration in here, and they didn't because they didn't break it down at the root pass. So this is another example of incomplete penetration. This is the one that you are probably seeing a lot of as you're trying to do your 3 8 inch plate and you're not breaking it all the way down. You're not getting complete penetration all the way through. This is called a single V groove weld. And you should start paying attention to these, to these terms and definitions because they're going to become even more important as you go through these classes. Single V groove and it's incomplete penetration at the root. Here's a picture of one. And you can see that, that it's been stressed and, and bowed so we have a dimensional um, distortion and this weld just kind of runs down through here and it, there's a void here and you can see that it's actually cracked this weld in the back so the, this, this stress riser here from this incomplete joint penetration moved into this back weld and actually cracked it and then if we x-ray it this is what that would show up as on an x-ray when you're looking at an x-ray wherever the weld metal is thicker it's going to be lighter lighter colored that's because fewer x-rays pass through the metal to reach the film. Here, there's not as much metal, and so more of the film got exposed by the x-rays, and therefore that dark line showed up. So that is incomplete joint penetration. Next, oh, I'm sorry, this is, this is one that shows starts and stops. Uh, we would call them toenails or fingernails. Uh, if any of you have welded pipe, this is where you didn't properly tie in uh, on your root pass. So these are, these are incomplete penetration faults on, on starts and stops. So it's just another example of, of incomplete penetration. Next, we have excessive penetration, too much. The, all of the codes out there only allow a maximum of 1 8 inch weld reinforcement, whether it's the face or the root. Anything more than that is excessive reinforcement, excessive penetration. This too would be a defect, so we can't have that. The maximum you're allowed is one eighth of an inch, and most of them want it to be about a sixteenth. Weld reinforcement, it's weld metal in excess of the quantity required to fill the joint. That's the definition of it. Anything more than that is excessive penetration. Now, this next topic, whiskers, I don't have a, a slide for whiskers, but all that is is whenever you're welding, I probably use this term with you, if, if you're welding, you, you'll see this mostly on, on overhead. If, if you're welding and you're putting your root joint in there and, and you've got your gun pointed up like this and you're coming along the joint and, and you're trying to get that metal to hump up in there, of course you're going to try to put the, deposit the metal on the leading edge of the puddle. If you miss, it's going to put a wire up in there. That's what it's doing. Those are called whiskers. That's what your textbook is talking about. Now, I want you to study these weld defects and discontinuities in depth because I'm going to give you a lot of questions on these. So there'll be a lot of questions, like if I say, what's what are whiskers? It may be a multiple choice, it may be a true false, it may be a yes, no, it may be a completion, but you have to know what whiskers are because it's so common. Um, next, we go back to voids, and actually voids and incomplete uh, fusion are kind of kind of lumped together. Um, here's a single V groove, and here we have a void between beads. Here's a void between beads. Here's a void along the shoulder of the bevel, where they didn't break everything down. Whenever you're welding, especially with MIG, you have to remember to tie into all the surfaces. If you fail to tie into all the surfaces, whether it's against the parent metal or an adjacent weld bead, then you're going to have voids and incomplete fusion. Here's some, here's some more examples of incomplete fusion along the shoulder of the bevel uh, and this vertical member. Here's some incomplete fusion at the, at the toe of the weld, at the root of the weld. 
This is an x-ray, a radiograph, of sidewall incomplete fusion. Your book refers to this example as, uh, uh, as wagon tracks because that's the way it looks on an x-ray, wagon tracks. Now in order for an x-ray to show incomplete fusion, you have to have your x-ray source lined up almost exactly right to pick it up because uh, you can think of a sandwich. Uh, uh, if we were to x-ray a sandwich from above, we wouldn't be able to tell that it was layered. We'd have to turn the sandwich on its side and shoot down through the thickness of it in order to see that it was layered. Same thing here. You have to have your, your source oriented just right to pick up that, otherwise you won't see it on an x-ray. Incomplete fusion is defined as a weld discontinuity in which fusion did not occur between weld metal and fusion faces or adjoining weld beads. That is your definition of incomplete fusion. Porosity is our next topic. Um, real quickly, before I get into porosity, let me, let, me, let me back up and cover overlap. I, should, I had some slides that showed overlap, and, and I, I should have put them in here. We will come across them later on, but overlap is defined as metal that has overflowed the, the joint and is, is laying on, on the base metal without fusion. So this would be an example of overlap. This, this here did not fuse to the base metal, it's just laying on there. A non-standard term is cold rope or cold lap, but that's not the term you need to use. You need to use the proper term, which is overlap. Another way, another one that you might see, and, and you might have actually done this, on your single V-groove is if you get your root pass through there and it runs down on the inside. This would be overlap. It's weld metal that has not fused to the base metal in excess of what was required to fill the joint. So that's another example of overlap. Your book talks about overlap. You may be asked about overlap in, on your test. Now let's go back to porosity. Uh, this is a biggie. Porosity is a biggie especially with the gas metal arc welding process because if you lose your shielding or the, or the base metal is contaminated, you're going to get porosity. Porosity is hydrogen bubbles, hydrogen bubbles that get sucked into the weld metal and they can't propagate out of there. It looks like Swiss cheese. If you want to see an example of, of porosity, next time you go back to your welding booth, go ahead and try to weld a little bit without any shielding gas and you'll see what porosity looks like. Porosity is a cavity type discontinuity formed by gas entrapped during weld metal solidification. That's its definition, and it's probably the most prevalent of, of, of the discontinuities, and you will get a question on porosity. I am going to ask you about that. And they give us a lot of bulleted items here, and it says, study the following causes of porosity carefully. I may ask you to give me a couple of things that could cause porosity. So you should definitely know what porosity is. If you take a look at this slide, we have linear surface porosity with a connecting crack. All of these holes are porosity. And the weld metal, as everybody knows, whenever you weld, it produces stress in the, in the metal. So there was stress in this metal and there was so much porosity that it caused all these porosity bubbles to connect through a crack. So that's kind of an extreme example of porosity. This is an x-ray of porosity, and you can see this is scattered porosity. There's a speck here, there's a speck here, here's some here, here's some here, there's some back over here. There's different kinds. Sometimes it's called peppered porosity, sometimes it's called shotgun porosity, sometimes the, uh, it's called cluster porosity. I've got a slide of that we'll look at in a second. Proper term here is scattered porosity. Most welding codes allow some scattered porosity. You don't have to have it absolutely clean, but if it exceeds allowable limits, then it's a defect and, and the weld is rejected. Here is cluster porosity, and you can see how concentrated it is right here. No cluster porosity is allowed on a pressure retaining part. You can't, it's not allowed at all because if, if there's pressure inside a piece of pipe and you have cluster porosity, just like a worm sliding itself through, through Swiss cheese, it could find a path to escape. And so no cluster porosity is allowed at all. This is a picture of linear porosity running right down the center of this weld. 
and you can see how bad it is. And which brings us to cracks. Cracks is on page 820 in your book. There's an awful lot of cracks. Read about cracks. There's, there's so much about cracks um, that I, I really can't cover it at all right now. There's hot cracks, cold cracks, toad cracks, heat affected zone cracks, under bead cracks, throat cracks. There's just a ton of cracks. I want you to know what a crack is. A fracture type discontinuity characterized by a sharp tip and high ratio of length to width to opening displacement. So it's the sharp tip that is most important to remember. Cracks are the most severe of all defects. Criticality. Write that off in, in the paragraph of your book. Discontinuity, criticality. Everything we've been talking about, incomplete fusion, lack of penetration, overlap, porosity, those are all discontinuities. Of discontinuities, what makes them the worst, what makes them the most critical? A crack is the most critical. Why? Because it has a sharp end condition. And if it has a sharp end condition, it can propagate, it can grow. So it's very, very bad. So I'm, uh, you may get a question on your test as to, of all these different discontinuities, which is the most severe? You're going to answer a crack. Spatter. Well, I, I, I like spatter, and I've been on everybody's case ever since you started taking classes here about keeping spatter under control. Why? Well, let's read of all, first of all, what spatter is. Metal particles expelled during fusion that do not form part of the weld. Okay? That's what spatter is. Metal particles expelled during fusion welding that do not form part of the weld. Why is it so bad? Take a look at this picture. This is spatter that landed on a piece of high strength carbon steel and look at the crack that it caused. Bet you didn't know spatter could do that. It can do that. So you want to try to keep your spatter under control because it can cause cracks. Undercut. Undercut is a groove melted into the base metal adjacent to the weld toe or weld root and left unfilled by weld metal. So of course you're all by this time familiar with undercut. Um, here's the typical appearance of undercut. You may be seeing some of this in your work. This would be slump. This is, this is undercut probably caused by either the wrong angle on the uh, electrode or getting the base metal too hot before you tried to fill it. And here this would probably be technique wise. You see the difference? See how that's kind of smooth and this is kind of sharp. This would be a technique uh, caused undercut. But while we're on this slide, this is overlap running down the side of the metal. This is overlap running down the side of the metal. And this is overlap running, flowing out onto the base metal. Uh, they use this slide in this series of slides to to talk about both undercut and uh, overlap. Okay, that takes care of all of our discontinuities. Now we need to talk a little bit about about safety. Eye, face, and body protection. Um, it says welding helmets and protective clothing worn when working with other electric uh, welding processes are necessary. Uh, the radiate energy, uh, particularly in the ultraviolet range that is produced by the gas shielded process is five to thirty times more intense than that produced by shielded metal arc process. So that's a bullet, five to thirty times. Uh, I, wanna, I want to draw your, draw your attention back to some safety slides. And as we go through these slides, I'll, I'll mention some things in your book I think you need to be aware of. Um, you notice that this slide says potential job hazards for inspectors. Uh, that's welding inspectors, but that applies for everybody. Electric shock, falling, radiation, burns, eye hazards, smoke and fumes, falling objects. These are all things that you're going to find in the workplace. These are the things that you need to be aware of. Personal protective equipment for welders. And you can see that this welder has a, he has his hood on, he's got his safety glasses, gloves, an apron, a jacket with all the buttons done up. You can't see it, but he's got still toed leather boots without any laces showing. Uh, so he's, he's ready to work and he's working in a safe manner. 
we, we will have to assume or, or presume that he has uh, earplugs in. Eye, ear, face, and head protection. Here are some examples of that. Any of you that have worked in the field, uh, many companies require that you wear a hard hat while you're welding. So you have to have your, have your welding hood attached to your hard hat in order to weld. Different types of safety goggles, safety glasses, grinding shields, protection. No job's worth doing if somebody's going to get hurt doing it. So read about uh, face, eye, and body protection. Particularly, uh, this first bulleted item, uh, I want you to read uh, about the standard arc welding helmets. Uh, I'm going to ask a question on that. I'm going to ask a question on the next two bulleted items. Uh, particularly on that third bulleted item, it said shirts should be dark in color to reduce reflections, thereby preventing ultraviolet burns and so forth. You'll get a question on that, which brings us to protective clothing. Sturdy boots with no laces. Clean clothing. Woolen clothing is best. Treated cotton is acceptable, but no synthetics. This is of the 70s. Synthetics burn. Pants without cuffs. Pants must be worn outside your boots. You want flaps on your shirt pockets, so no sparks will go in there. Cap, gloves, and leathers. So read about that. I am going to ask a question on the first bulleted item and the third bulleted item. Then compressed gas cylinders. Um, highlight all of those bulleted items. There is going to be a question on those bulleted items about gas cylinders. What do you do with gas cylinders? You have to identify them properly. What are they? Are you hooking up to the correct gas for what you want to do? You want to protect them from being damaged? You want to hoist them properly with a sling. You don't ever want to try to pick them up by the, by the caps. You always keep them upright. Uh, don't, lay them, don't lay them down unless you absolutely have to. And if you do it with a settle in, you've got to leave it up and let it drain back out again. Uh, that's a different topic altogether, but definitely you want to keep a settle in standing upright. And then you have to secure them with change. Uh, don't, you don't weld on cylinders. Don't ground them electrically. Sometimes they'll become part of your welding circuit and you won't even realize it. Uh, and of course they're under high pressure and they could go off like a torpedo. Never use them as a roller. Don't expose them to temperatures below 200 degrees or to temperatures above 1300 degrees. And never lay them on, your, on their side. Fume exposure. Ventilation. This is ventilation in your text. Uh, there's a number of bulleted items here on ventilation. One thing that I didn't find here is the topic of the fume plume. Fume plume. That's a bullet. Write it off on the side of your column. Fume plume. Fume exposure. Exp exposure. Note the head position. He's got his head well back so that these fumes are moving up and away from him. These fumes are comprised of particulate matter. You can breathe those things in. The best thing you can do to protect yourself as a welder is to keep your head out of the fume plume. That's the number one thing. Fume avoidance, the most important factor in avoiding fumes during welding is the position of the welder's head. Keeping the head out of the fume plume will avoid breathing the vast majority of fumes created. Number one thing, fume plume, keep your head out of it. Uh, here's some gas removal systems. You see he's got a precipitator up here and he's sucking the, the smoke away from him. Ventilation types, how do you keep the smoke away? Well, through natural uh, means, working outside or working with the doors open. Through mechanical fans, exhaust hoods in the top of the building, downdraft tables where they'll actually suck the fumes down and blow them out, and then air ventilated helmets, positive air helmets. I've had to wear those before. You get into a smoke-filled environment to where you can't even see in front of you and it's just boiling with smoke and they pump air into you so that you can breathe. They work pretty efficiently, they're really uncomfortable to, to wear and they'll dry your throat out, your throat and your nose. Confined spaces, uh, you gotta be careful about ventilation in confined spaces, particularly when you have uh, gases such as argon. Remember we talked a minute ago about argon being heavier than air? It could displace the air in here. If it displaced the air in here, you could crawl in there and die of asphyxiation because there's no air. So you always have to sniff those areas first to make sure that it's safe to go into. Confined space safety factors. 
cleanliness, ventilation. Be careful of the welding gases. Never put them inside with you. Be careful of electrical shock. Think about escape aspects. You have to have an entry permit and a standby person. Those are all factors involved in confined space. Shielding gases, argon and, and helium, you can't breathe them. Nitrogen, carbon dioxide, they're reactive gases, but they'll also kill you. They're odorless, colorless, and here's the most important one, they can displace oxygen. So you'll die, uh, you'll suffocate. Electric shocks, you have a, uh, highlight that first paragraph on page 822 about electrical safety. Anything over six milliamp years can be harmful. So there's many sources, uh, insulation, you have to make sure that everything's insulated well, good connections, you have to have personnel training to understand electric shock. You're more likely to become electrocuted from, uh, from your grinder than you are from your welding machine. Fire prevention, highlight the second half of that for, uh, pardon me, under fire, uh, wire feeder safety, highlight the second part of that paragraph. There'll be a question coming out of there. And then under fire safety, highlight those bulleted items. Um, designated welding and cutting areas. Work areas must be free of combustibles. You have to have an understanding of the equipment, an understanding of the processes. A fire watch, if necessary, somebody just standing back and keeping an eye on things while you're doing your work, and a hot work permit. You may get a question, particularly one about hot work permits. What is a hot work permit? It describes the date, time, and location of where you're doing the work, what type of work, whether or not you took flammability checks, whether or not you have fire extinguishers present, any kind of special instructions that you have, and your boss has to sign off, as well as you. Okay, now that brings us to the end of our slides. So now, Get back to our book. Uh, we're on page 823, care and use of equipment. The last paragraph on that topic, it says, the equipment has to be kept clean in proper condition and in good mechanical condition. The wire feeding system requires special attention. Maladjustment leads to erratic wire feeding, which in turn causes porosity. Uh, care of nozzles, we talked about nozzles earlier. Let me get this out here. This, of course, is our nozzle, and if you look at that picture, you're looking head-on to this nozzle here, and you see they've, they've really got it chingered up with all kinds of spatter. Uh, highlight that last paragraph there where it says, if the spatter builds up thick enough, it can actually bridge the gap and electrically connect the insulated nozzle to the contact tube. It's going to arc out on you. Uh, if you accidentally touch the, contact, uh, touch the nozzle to a grounded surface, when this happens, there will be a flash, and it is quite likely that the nozzle will be ruined. So if you don't realize that that spatter has built up and it's, and it's actually bridged that space there and then you go to weld and you touch this to whatever it is you're trying to weld, it's going to arc out and it's going to burn a big old gouge of that thing out of there because now this thing's become electrified. So you have to be careful. Keep that thing clean. Uh, care of the contact tubes. This is a bullet. The contact tube transfers the welding current to the electrode. Well, what do they mean by that? This thing. Okay. Um, new contact tubes have smooth round holes of the proper minimum diameter. The hole has to be big enough to allow wire with a slight cast to pass through easily. It's our liner. Uh, with the use, the wire weaves the hole to an oval shape, especially on the end closest to the arc. Uh, the wire slides more easily, but the transfer of current is not as good, therefore arcing of the tube results, and the movement of the wire can actually be stopped. When this happens, you have to replace that contact tube. Um, let's see, read about, under care of wire feed cables, highlight that second paragraph. There'll be a bullet coming out of there, a question about wire feed cables. Um, wire feed cables should be cleaned with dried compressed air. The conduit should be removed at the feed roll end. The air nozzle placed on the tip of the contact tube. This results in a reverse flush lubricating, this is your bullet, lubricating a blown out wire feed cable with dry powder graphite reduces the friction of the cable and results in smooth wire feed. 
So I'm either going to ask you how you would do that if you were going to put graphite in it, or if you should use, use dry compressed air, or should you use a solvent, or should you use oil. You're going to get a question to, to that effect. Bird nesting. If anybody's ever fished with an open face fishing reel, and, and the, wires, uh, the, the line's trying to come out too fast and it just bubbles up on you, that's a bird nest. Same thing happens with a wire feeder. So understand what, what uh, bird nesting is. Cleanliness of the base metal. Read that first paragraph, there will be a bullet coming out of that about the cleanliness. Drop down to that last paragraph there and highlight that which says a good general rule to follow is to clean the area, area thoroughly before welding. <coughs> arc blow, you should already know what arc blow is, but refresh yourself on that because there will be a question on arc blow. The question comes from the second, um, from the next page. Arc blow does not occur with AC welding arcs because the forces exerted by the magnetic field on the flexible conductor uh, are reversed 120 times. You can't have magnetic arc filled with AC, only with DC. It doesn't matter if it's DC reverse or DC uh, negative or DC straight, it's still going to uh, cause a magnetic field. But you don't have one with AC, so keep that one in mind. Let's see. Setting up the equipment. Um, Highlight those. There's six bulleted items there. Know those. I've, I've got a mark here that I was going to bring a question out of there, but I can't for the life of me think of what that question is right now. So there'll be a question coming out of one of those six bulleted items. Uh, your starting procedure, make sure that the, the work or ground cable is connected properly. You turn on the welding machine. Turn on the wire feeding unit if it's not already hardwired in. Check your shielding gas. Um, your flow rate should be 15 to 25 cubic feet per hour. That's abbreviated CPH. Uh, then you're going to make all your adjustments. Let's see. Nothing there, nothing there. Oh, there's one, something I wanted to show you. Let's go to an overlay. This is table 23-6, and it's a troubleshooting table. And this is on page 830. If you're having problems, go to this table, and it will help you to understand uh, some of the things that could be happening. For example, oops, that's the wrong one. I'm sorry. I threw the wrong one up there. There we go. That's the one that we have. That's on page 830. Just take the, take the first one, for example. Porosity, internal porosity, or, or visible porosity. You can go down through here. Uh, wire composition could be, a good, could be one of the problems. Uh, your gas shielding might be inadequate. Uh, there could be oil, rust, or paint present. Uh, the type of steel that you're using, or the surface treatment of the steel, could all cause internal porosity. And you can see there's, <laughs> they really got some un- Unusual names, blobbing. I don't know what blobbing is. I've never heard of blobbing. So <laughs> look at some of these things. Uh, but look it over, and you, you'll get, get an idea of, of what can, can happen and how to correct it. Another thing I wanted to point, point out to you is, I've mentioned this before in other lectures, the big print giveth and the little print taketh away. Um, when I was talking about uh, steel, it said, item number six, come down here and read the note. It says, rimming grades require higher deoxidized wires. So that leads you down to, uh, to the specifics of what could be wrong. Um, so don't just go here by, by whatever it says on these items. You have to look at the notes. The big print giveth, the little print get, taketh away. And so we have polarity, a one. Come down here, it said, one. Should be DCEBP, DCEN. Looks very similar in short arc welding. Or go on over here. Here's two. Wind. Uh, wind shields are recommended for winds over five miles per hour. So you see it gives you additional information, additional notes. You, sh you should learn to look at the entire thing. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Okay, go to page 833 on fillet welds, bullet. Fillet welds are used in T-joints, lap joints, and corner joints. Much of the welding done with the gas metal arc process is fillet welding. Uh, read all of that. Um, 
There's an item, I have an item mentioned and underlined out of each one of those paragraphs. Let's see, nothing there, nothing there, nothing there. MIG welding of aluminum bullet. Pure aluminum melts at 1220 degrees Fahrenheit. Aluminum alloys have an approximate melting rate of 900 to 1220 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on the alloy. Bullet, aluminum and its alloys rapidly develop a tenacious refractory oxide film when exposed to air. I talked in depth about that a while ago. The melting point for, of, for aluminum oxide is 3600 degrees. Three times the melting temperature of the aluminum itself. The oxide film must be removed or broken up during welding to permit the base metal and filler metal to flow together properly when fusion welding or permit flow in brazing or soldering. The oxide may be removed by fluxes, by the action of the welding arc in an inert gas atmosphere or by mechanical and chemical means. Uh, so there's a couple of bullets there. Know the melting points, uh, know about the oxide, know about how it, it takes three times as much uh, temperature to melt the oxides as it does the aluminum itself. So what happens is you get that crust over the outside and you might break through it at one point and it's melting the aluminum underneath but that crust is still on top. It's kind of like a wormhole. Rather interesting. Um, read about the, uh, on, on page 840, those four bulleted items. The following factors make gas metal arc welding a desirable joining process. Ta read about joint preparation. There'll be a bullet coming out of joint preparation. Uh, let's see, shielding gas, bullet, argon is preferred for a welding aluminum plate thicknesses up to one inch thick. When compared with helium, argon provides better metal transfer and better arc star, uh, stability, thus reducing spatter. Uh, spray arc welding of aluminum, over on the next uh, page it says, welding can be done in all positions with the spray arc type transfer but now we're talking aluminum, not mild steel. And a bullet is the gas metal arc welding dash P. Mode of transfer is very effective when welding aluminum. Remember that the P would be pulsed. It gives excellent control over the heat input and makes welding thin sections and out of position welding much easier. So that would be a bullet. I'm gonna want you to know what GMAWP is. And if you look there uh, on that same page, he, the, the gun he's using, that's one of those push-pull guns that we talked about in the last chapter, and he's welding aluminum with it. Remember, aluminum's too soft to push all that way, so they've got to pull it part way. Uh, flip the page, 842, under inspection and testing, the bulleted items, there is a question. I'm going to ask a question about crater cracks. Coming off of page 842, um, over on page 845, mag welding of stainless steel, Read about that. There are two bullets coming out of that second column. Um, one bullet is coming out of that first paragraph, which begins, because stainless steel has a lower rate of thermal conductivity, bullet. Uh, and then farther down it says, no air must be permitted to reach the underside of the weld while the weld pull is solidifying. Bullet, the oxygen and nitrogen in the air weaken molten stainless steel during cooling. It is, if it is difficult to use a backing bar argon should be used as a purge gas. So there's a couple of bullets there. Uh, let's see. Over on page 846, bullet on hot cracking. And a big bullet on stainless steel sensitization. Know what carbide precipitation is. Carbide precipitation. Um, typically what happens is whenever you're welding with, with Stainless steels, it, it passes through uh, the sensitization range twice, once going up, once coming down. And at that time, the stainless steel and chromium, the stainless steel, chromium in the stainless steel bonds with uh, iron and it forms chromium carbides, which rob the base metal of the, the stainless steel of its chromium resistance, causing it to eat away. So read about that, know what that is, because you're going to get a question on carbide precipitation. Uh, and I believe that is it. I'm sorry.